Good morning. Welcome to King of Kings on this second Sunday of Easter. Once again, we have the joy of rejoicing in the resurrection. Christ is risen. For whatever is born of God overcomes the world. Christ is risen. We'll begin with the opening hymn. of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. 
Let us confess our sins unto our gracious Lord. Almighty God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, mighty judge of all people, we admit and confess our sinfulness. We have not lived up to our calling as your peaceable people. We have not nurtured or encouraged peace in our homes, our neighborhoods, and our communities. We have not done the good you demand and have not been the people you would have us be. We do repent and are truly sorry for our sins in thought, word, and action. Have mercy on us, Father, for the sake of Jesus Christ, your Son. Forgive us, renew us, keep us ever mindful that we need your lavish grace. By the power of the Holy Spirit, direct us to serve you faithfully all our days through Jesus Christ, our Lord. God has promised his merciful forgiveness to those who by the power of the Holy Spirit have been brought to repentance and have turned to him in confession. He will revive them and speak peace to his people. In his place and by his command, therefore, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. May our God keep you in his grace by the Holy Spirit, lead you in ways of peace and joy, and finally bring you to live with him forever. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The works of the Lord are great and glorious. His name is worthy of praise. disciples and took away their fears with your word of peace. Come to us also by word and sacrament and banish our fears with the comforting assurance of your abiding presence. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. first lesson for this morning is recorded in the book of Acts, chapter 3, verses 12 through 20. You see the amazing wisdom of our God that uses even man's sin sinfulness to fulfill his promise to save us. When Peter saw this, he said to them, Men of Israel, why does this surprise you? Why do you stare at us as if by our own power or godliness we had made this man walk? The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his servant Jesus. You handed him over to be killed, and you disowned him before Pilate, though he had decided to let him go. You disowned the Holy and Righteous One and asked that a murderer be released to you. You killed the author of life, but God raised him from the dead. We are witnesses of this. By faith in the name of Jesus, this man whom you see and know was made strong. It is Jesus' name and the faith that comes through him that has given this complete healing to him, as you can all see. Now, brothers, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did your leaders, but this is how God fulfilled what he had foretold through all the prophets, saying that his Christ would suffer. Repent, then, and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord, and that he may send the Christ who has been appointed for you, even Jesus. This is the word of the Lord. We'll join in hymn 161.
The second lesson is recorded in Paul's first epistle to the Corinthians, chapter 15, verses 12 through 22. Paul talks about the importance of the resurrection to our salvation. But if it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, how can some of you say there is no resurrection from the dead? If there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. More than that, we are then found to be false witnesses about God. For we have testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead. But he did not raise him if in fact the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. You're still in your sins. Then those who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are to be pitied more than all men. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. This is the word of our Lord. Alleluia, alleluia, Christ is risen, he's risen indeed, alleluia. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Alleluia. Please rise for the gospel. The Holy Gospel according to St. John, chapter 20. The risen Savior appears to his disciples on Easter evening. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and sighed. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone his sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Now Thomas, called Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands, and put my finger where the nails were, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe it. A week later his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Jesus did many other miraculous signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. This is the gospel of our Lord. You may be seated. The hymn of the day is, O Sons and Daughters of the King.
In the name of our risen Savior who has blessed us with faith that believes even though we haven't seen with our eyes. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, the lesson that I want to talk to you about this morning comes from the opening words of Paul's first epistle to the Corinthians chapter 15, the resurrection chapter. Now brothers, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you which you have received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel you are saved. If you hold firmly to the word I preach to you, otherwise you have believed in vain. For what I received I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Peter and then to the twelve. After that he appeared to more than five hundred of the brothers at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all he appeared to me also as to one abnormally born. This is God's word. Do you believe in UFOs? For me, UFOs were those headlines in the National Enquirer you see as you go through the checkout aisles at the grocery store, and there's something I kind of always snickered at. But I have to admit to you that that has somewhat changed for me. On November 14th in 2004, a Navy pilot named Commander David Fraber took off in his Hornet from the USS Nimitz off the coast of San Diego. He was on a training mission. And then that training mission was interrupted because the radar team on the USS Princeton told him there was something that they were seeing on the radar and they revectored him to a different location. Well, he didn't know why at first, but he found out in just a moment because he looked out and he saw this oval-shaped object, kind of looked like a tic-tac, hovering over the Pacific Ocean, and then it would change direction quickly, like a, like a ping-pong ball being pounced off the wall. Well, you can imagine, he decided to fly down and take a closer look, and when he did that, this strange craft started mirroring his maneuvers. So then he decided he was going to try to intersect that, and in an instant, that unidentified flying object flew past his nose and disappeared in an instant. Well, the Navy had prearranged a rendezvous point for all of the, the people on this mission, and the pilots were supposed to meet at a very specific destination, and as they were making their way there, the radar team called them again and said, we can see on our instrument that that unidentified flying object is at the rendezvous point, 60 miles away, flew there in one minute. In order for that to be possible, that thing would have had to travel 3,700 miles per hour. Not even our most sophisticated jets have that capability. So I'm going to ask you again, do you believe in UFOs? Well, I suppose it would be easy to brush that off as just one guy that was trying to gain a little attention for himself. One eyewitness is easy to discount, I suppose. But what if I told you that his wingman saw the same thing? And remember, they were revectored to a different site because that radar team saw something on their instruments. When they returned to the USS Nimitz and landed, another team went out and they were looking specifically for that UFO. And you want to know what? They found it. They found it, and not only did they find it, they were able to videotape the whole thing. I went and watched the whole thing on YouTube. 
Oh, well, I suppose you could fake all that too. But a year ago, about this very time, the U.S. Department of Defense released those once classified videos, basically admitting they were authentic. I'm not standing up here trying to make the case that there are little green men from Mars in those UFOs, but it's hard to ignore evidence, isn't it? Especially when it's video evidence. And not only do you have video evidence, you have an eyewitness account of a trusted naval commander. And if you think about it, if anyone found out that he was perpetrating a hoax, his entire career could have been killed. And so the fact that he's even talking about it today means that that event had a dramatic effect on his life. A 2020 Ipsos poll said that 52% of Americans believe in UFOs. And the reason I looked into that number is because my suspicion was that more Americans believe in UFOs than believe in the resurrection. It turns out that's not the case. There are actually 64% of Americans that believe in the resurrection. But if you look into the numbers, if you're from the northeast part of the country, if you're wealthy, if you have an education beyond high school, then you're less likely to believe in the resurrection. And the group of people that are least likely to believe in the resurrection are millennials. So that means if you're a smart, successful person living anywhere other than flyover country, and you're not old as dust, <laughs> then you're not likely to believe in the resurrection at all. But what I want to show you, in fact, what Paul talks about today is the resurrection is real for those very same reasons that people try to convince us that UFOs are real. There is evidence. There were eyewitness accounts. And it had a dramatic effect on people's lives, too. The Apostle Paul was writing to the Christians in Corinth about a decade and a half after the resurrection. And those people, some of them at least, had some real doubts about the resurrection of all people on the last day. Some of them had doubts about the resurrection of Jesus. And we heard in the epistle lesson just what a dramatic effect that has on our salvation. Paul said, if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. If you don't believe that one day you are going to rise from the dead, then you also have to discount the fact that Jesus rose from the dead too, because Jesus tied those two events together. Because I live, you also will live. And if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, then what in the world are we doing here today? I'm wasting my time, you're wasting your time. All of the faith in the world isn't going to change the fact that one day our existence is going to come to an end in the grave. So Paul takes this very seriously, and he lays out the historical facts one by one. Did you hear them? For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day, according to the scriptures. Even the first century Jewish secular historian, Josephus reported that a man named Jesus was put to death on a cross as ordered by Pilate. 
There were Roman soldiers posted at that grave at the insistence of Jesus' enemies so that no one could tamper with that grave. They could testify that the spear went into his side, the blood and water flowed from his side, showing that he was already dead. That body was, in fact, placed into the grave. And the evidence is there's no body there. The women who came to the tomb to properly prepare Jesus' body for burial, they saw it first. And then James and John saw it too. Think about this. If the story was completely and totally made up, then those Roman soldiers, they would have more they would want to tell that story. They would want to make sure that got out more than anyone else, right? Their very lives were on the line. And I have no doubt that there were those that tried to cover up the missing body by saying that some of his disciples came to steal the body to show that what he said about his resurrection came true. In fact, the Jewish leaders paid off the Roman soldiers to tell that very story. But think about this piece of evidence. There's still no body. No body was able to be located, and you and I know exactly why. Because the resurrection is real. But the fact is, there's more evidence than just the empty tomb. There were eyewitness accounts, too. Paul talks about them. He appeared to Peter, and then to the twelve. It wasn't just a grieving woman who wanted to see Jesus. It was more than just a couple of disciples on the road to Emmaus who wanted the stories to be true. Jesus appeared to the twelve. He appeared to his entire inner circle at different times in various locations. Hallucination? except for the fact that hallucinations don't happen in groups. The disciples saw what they saw with their own eyes. Uh, But the disciples had an agenda. They were true believers. They were committed to the cause. But Paul tells us that after that, Jesus appeared to more than 500 of the brothers at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Go and interview them. Go and talk to them yourself. They'll tell you what they saw. And Paul goes on, Then he appeared to James, and then to all the apostles, and the last of all, he appeared to me also as to one abnormally born. Paul wasn't an apostle like the rest. He became an apostle because of an event in his life. If you think about it, None of those eyewitness accounts are as shocking as the last one. The disciples could be dismissed because they had an agenda. And I suppose the 500, well, they could be dismissed because some of them had an agenda too. But Paul? Paul was an enemy of Christ. A purveyor of the cross a persecutor of Christians. But when Jesus appeared to him on the road of Damascus and knocked him off his horse, he couldn't deny it any longer. The resurrection is real. And although his physical eyes were blinded for a moment, for the first time he could see through the eyes of faith, the resurrection is real. The grave is empty. Jesus lives. So, we have the evidence of the empty tomb. We have the eyewitness accounts, but there is one more piece of evidence that I want to share with you, and that's that the events of Easter had a dramatic effect on people's lives. The Roman soldiers knew, but they had been paid off to say that Jesus' body had been stolen. But the disciples... They could have been rounded up and executed just like Jesus, and yet they told 
the story. 500 people wouldn't still be talking about it to this day if it were nothing more than a hoax. And then think about the life of the Apostle Paul, 180 degree turnaround from persecutor to proclaimer. And although some of those believers in Corinth denied the resurrection, there were some there that didn't. And they were talking about it too, in spite of the fact that at this time, Christians had been kicked out of Rome because they were nothing more than troublemakers. The persecutors, the persecution of Christians had begun, and in less than a decade, Nero would be lighting Christians on fire, and yet they spoke. Because they knew and believed the resurrection is real. So there you have it. The evidence is overwhelming, undeniable. And yet a third of this country believes, and two-thirds is underwhelmed, 115 million people still in denial. How can that be? Because all the evidence in the world isn't enough. All the evidence in the world isn't enough to convince someone the resurrection is real. And that's why the Apostle Paul doesn't start with the historical facts. Listen to how he begins. Now, brothers, I want to remind you of the gospel I preach to you, which you have received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel, you are saved. Well, evidence can cause us to question. Eyewitness accounts can make us wonder. Changed lives might cause unbelievers to admire Christian conviction, but only the gospel can change skeptics into believers. And so here we're here today not to pat ourselves on the back because we got it, not to rejoice in the fact that we understand the reality of the empty tomb by our logic. We're here because of the grace of God. We're here because the grace of God sent his Holy Spirit into our unbelieving hearts, our blind, sinful hearts, and he opened our eyes to see the empty tomb as the reality of our salvation. It's the reality of our sins forgiven, the reality that we are at peace with our God, that our eternity is secure. It's our claim on the inheritance of heaven. All of that, all of it comes to us only by the grace of God. I don't believe in little green men in spaceships. It might take a little more convincing for you to believe in UFOs, but by the grace of God, all of us today believe the unbelievable. We believe that the grave was empty, and it was empty because Jesus rose, and because Jesus lives. And because of that gift of the Holy Spirit, we can leave here today in complete and absolute comfort, forgiveness. It's our possession. Peace is our possession. Heaven is absolutely certain. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for empowering all of us to believe the unbelievable and to know the resurrection is real. Amen. The peace of God that transcends all the human understanding. Guard and keep your hearts and your minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. Join together with me now in confessing your Christian faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. 
he descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. We pray. God of all grace, we thank you for the gift of eternal life in your Son. By the resurrection of Jesus from the dead and by the faithful testimony of the apostles, you have assured us that our faith stands on a sure and solid foundation. Though we do not see Jesus with our physical eyes, help us see him with the eyes of faith. Through your Holy Spirit, breathe on your church that it may faithfully proclaim the gospel of our risen Savior with courage and diligence in all lands to all people. Grant that we also may be illumined by the heavenly light of your word, and so keep us in the one and, and only true faith. Preserve us from all assaults on our soul, deliver us from doubt and despair, and preserve us from worldly wisdom and false teaching. Forgive the sins of your people, strengthen the doubting and faithless, bring back the forgetful and the wayward, and comfort the anxious and distressed. And as we go from this holy place today, grant us peace and rest. We pray all this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. We'll join together in hymn number 308.
precious Savior, as you once stood among your disciples after Easter to open their hearts and release them from fear, so come among us and open our hearts to believe and our minds to understand your word and will. Break down the barriers within us that we may with all our hearts, mind, and strength believe in Jesus Christ, your Son, and serve you to the glory of your holy name through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. You may be seated. We'll close with hymn number 386, Now I Have the Firm Foundation.
Good morning. Welcome once again. Just a couple of announcements. First of all, the ALA Golf Classic um, is on the 24th rather than the 28th, and the cost is $100 a piece, or uh, I believe it's $80 if you have a foursome. So those corrections made to that announcement. Also, next week, we are going to go back to having communion at the rail, and we're going to try and put uh, eight people up at a time separate yourself out as much as you can we will continue to have the uh, wafers placed out on a tray so that you can grab them without having to touch others or have them handed to you um, your faith your salvation hinges on the resurrection and the empty tomb if that grave wasn't empty then Christ's holiness was not enough to save you. If Christ's grave was not empty, then his divine blood was not enough to wash away your sins. But by God's grace, he accepted that sacrifice for you. Your sins are forgiven, washed away for good. You have holiness and stand before God as a saint. That's what it's all about. And all of that is our gift. Gift to us from the Holy Spirit. Take some time. Rejoice in that as you go home today.